you will look with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15. I've entitled this message, A Temple in Heaven. Sound like a surprise to you because as we've studied, we know that the temple was done away. But as we read here in Ex, uh, Revelation chapter 15, we see John's attention drawn to a temple. As it says there in verse 5, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So it uses the same language that we're used to reading in the Old Testament, and yet we find it here pictured in heaven. So what's this all about? Well, let's read the chapter, and then I hope to help us uh, understand this a little better, at least the Spirit teaching us. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues it's important to bring out here that as I've been saying throughout the study here in Revelation the the different uh, the trumpets and the different revelations that we've seen in the numbers of, of seven throughout this book they're all cyclical it's talking about the same thing punishments that the Lord brings upon the earth until Christ comes again but here when it says the seven last plagues it's a reminder that there is an end that the Lord is going to wrap this whole thing up he, he might use wars and famines and disease and death all these things to execute his judgments and has been doing so throughout history since the fall of, of Adam. But there are described in what's ahead here the last plagues in which uh, when it's done he will indeed uh, destroy this earth and Christ will come again. And so that language is important because it says here, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. All those that, for whom Christ did not bear that wrath, these are reminders, just small reminders, of the wrath of God that awaits any outside of Christ. I don't care how terrible the disease, it might be a man's flesh, uh, that flesh-eating flesh disease that just leaves a man consumed uh, if he's outside of Christ even that is a mercy compared to the wrath of God that awaits him when he dies uh, I don't think that that can be impressed enough upon our minds and hearts a, a man that has starved to death in a terrible situation caught up in a mountain somewhere lost or frozen to death on his escapades and people talk about how horrible a death that was and what a, what a relief death must have been when he was delivered from that situation if he was outside of Christ it was no relief at all but God ordains and purposes all of these things as a sign of his sovereignty, but also of his judgments upon sin, and, and uh, deservedly so. But here John says, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over the, his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, thou King of the justified ones. 
our sinners made saints, but through the blood of Christ. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now let's just take a minute to review what we've learned to this point in our study here in the book of Revelation, particularly as regards the history of the church and the advancement of the gospel in the world. I think it helps to review a little bit because it's taken us a while to get through Revelation, but I want us to keep the perspective of why I believe this book was written. And we saw in chapters one through three when we started the very first verse of Revelation is what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about God's spirit revealing Christ to sinners and doing it in a symbolic way. We all like picture books. Uh, some of us spend more time looking through a magazine at the pictures than we do reading, reading what it's about because that's what we're attracted to. This is a picture book of Christ, the book of Revelation. And once you understand, it's like looking at something. You can go downtown and look at that mural, that 12-story mural. I've had people say, well, you know, what is that? Why was that particular item put on that mural or that particular person chosen? Well, you can buy a legend. You can actually go and get a legend, and it'll give you a little detail of why every, every article that was placed on that mural downtown there's a reason why it's there it's symbolic you see this is this is the way we think and we're impressed and when God has written this scripture here he's taking what is common to man if you will he's taking what is infinite and putting it down in a language that by God's grace when you see and understand it you say okay I can see the glory of Christ in that because that's really what it's all about. And it's through the preaching of the gospel applied to the heart of God's elect by the Holy Spirit that churches are established. Isn't that what those first three chapters of Revelation are about? In the midst of turmoil, what is God doing? Establishing his church. That fits exactly what Christ said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That first century was a very difficult time. I, I, I don't know, I often wonder how I'd have stood in that day, but for the grace of God. To stand for the gospel that I preach to you today, in that day, meant death, immediate death. You think of John the Baptist even, at the hands of Herod, his ministry lasting only a year and a half. He was the forerunner of Christ. And yet it's not about John the Baptist. It's about Christ. It's about him who came and died and rose again and lives forever. And whether the Lord gives me a day to preach his glory or a 40-year ministry, it doesn't matter. If I'm his, I'm going to preach his glory. And the churches that are established, that he establishes, he gets the glory. You see, so that's... That's why we see there the church is described as lampstands. And we see Christ walking amongst the lampstands. What is that all about? Well, that's his church. And even in a world of darkness, we can, we can rest assured and be blessed with his constant spiritual presence. So it's all about Christ. And then as, you, as we looked in chapters 4 through 7, 
What do we find? Again and again, God's people being persecuted by the world. Why would we want to be the friend of this world? It stands against every attribute of our Lord Jesus Christ and what we glory in. So we don't cater to it. But we're going to know isolation. We're going to know separation. We might even know death as a result of what Christ has been pleased to reveal in us. We're going to be subjected to many trials and afflictions. So we saw in our Bible class the last two weeks that we're not exempt from these things. People going around saying, if you just trust in Jesus, all be well. Uh, they've got their head in the sand. Not the Christ of Scripture. Christ said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. That's what identifying with the gospel is all about. And God has purposed it. You say, well, why would he purpose that? Well, to draw you to him. Find your comfort and your confidence in him alone. We used to sing that hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Why does a person need to lean on those arms? It's because he's removing all confidence in the flesh over here. And that we're cast on his arms of mercy and grace daily. It's not just once in a while. Daily. Daily. And then in chapters 8 through 11 of Revelation, God's not silent. Whatever trouble that this world brings upon any of his redeemed ones, the scripture says God sees. He ordains it. He, he gives that freedom for that persecution to come. But at the same time, again and again, we see visited on the persecuting world God's judgments. We don't know the timing of it. We're not to try to take that into our own hands like the disciples when they were going through Samaria and no one would give them a place to stay because they were a band of Jews. And the disciples said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? They were thinking of Elijah. And he said, what? You don't know what spirit you're of. That's not in your hands. We're going to see that in the second message today, the vengeance of the Lord. It's, it's not ours, but it is his. And how he brings it to pass, how he executes it in his time, we patiently leave to him by his grace. But we do know that God will bring judgment upon this world. But no matter how much he casts as far as plagues and death and disease upon this world, that's not what brings repentance. So a lot of people think, well, the Lord's shaking this world up. I'm expecting a lot to be brought to repentance. That's not what brings repentance. Only the revelation of Christ by the Spirit to the heart through this word is what brings repentance. All it can do is make people more bitter. You know, people are a lot like cattle. You've heard this illustration before where they're out there eating in a field. And here comes the slaughter truck, pulls up. They lasso one of the the cows and put it in the back of the truck and haul it off to the slaughterhouse. And what do the other cows do? They look up for a while until the truck's down the road, and then what do they do? Go back to eating. That's the way men are. I've heard people say, I've heard people get religious when someone suddenly dies in a car crash or they hear of something horrible and suddenly they're awakened, it seems, and you're thinking, you're thinking what an opportunity to talk to them about Christ. Just give it a day or two. I, every funeral I've been asked to preach, I've always endeavored to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. But as far as I know, I don't know of anybody that's ever been brought to the Lord through a funeral message that I've preached. I've had people come up afterward and say, when I die, I want you to preach my funeral. My neighbor across the street said that. And I'm surprised. I'm sitting there thinking... Everything that I preach in that message is contrary to what she knows and believes. But it was a time where you showed them some sympathy. It was a time where you showed them some compassion. And we do that. We understand that, that death is a serious matter. But they don't bear the same burden as we do. I'm burdened for their souls. They're burdened for the one who's departed. And yet, there sits that neighbor across the street now. I've been there for 12 years. 
has no interest at all in coming in here in this message that I have to preach. But she's told me when she dies, I'm preaching her funeral. She had me preach her husband's funeral when he died. You sit there and say, well, why? What's the whole purpose of it? Sinners, regardless of, of what they know and face, as far as these, these things that God pours out on this earth, it's not going to move them to repentance. Even the Philippian jailer, it wasn't the earthquake that brought him to repentance. That stirred him up. It got his attention. But it was Paul speaking to him the word of the Lord. Everybody likes to quote Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But it doesn't stop there. Read verse 32. It says he took Paul aside and Paul spoke to him and his family, the house, the word of the Lord. And that's what the Lord used. All right? But uh, in chapters 12 through 14, leading up to what we're looking at here in, in uh, chapter 15, again and again we see the conflict between the church and the world. But this conflict is deeper than just personal differences. Like people like to say, well, that's, that's just a personal difference, the way you believe and the way we believe. No, it isn't. There's a... There's a greater conflict that goes all the way back to the garden. There's a conflict between Christ and Satan, between the seed of the woman and the dragon. And that's what we saw revealed. You know, you say, why, why is there this conflict? Well, there's a serpent, and there's a seed of the woman. There's a fall, and there's a savior. And that's, uh, that's the difference. Now, as we saw the seven trumpets of warning. See, and, and here we see the seven vials of wrath. These are all to describe God's dealings with this world as a fallen world. And, uh, and yet, no matter how much God brings to bear upon this world in that way, you ask yourself, why do I know Christ? You know, we had... I had trouble in my life before I ever knew the Lord, but it didn't bring me to repentance. What brought me to repentance was when God was pleased by his spirit to open these dead eyes and see a crucified Savior and see a just satisfaction in his death and to see a holy God that was satisfied by no other way than the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and brought me to bow and to cry out to him and to see that I'd been lost and didn't know it. You see, that's, that's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And that's why no matter what you're going through right now in your life, as far as trials and afflictions, troubles, uh, you know, I've, I've got a, a friend and acquaintance that's, that's just gone through bankruptcy. It's a horrible thing. When you see everything taken away and trouble and trial, but he has no more interest in coming and hearing the gospel than he had when he was still in his house and all was well. You know, that doesn't bring men to repentance. But if he's the Lord's and Christ has redeemed him, I look for a day when <laughs> the Lord's going to deal in his heart and cause him to think upon these things. That's why these meetings are, are vital. It pulls us aside. We're all knowing trouble. You know, that old song, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> That's just because you're thinking of yourself. Everybody around you knows trouble. Just give us all the time to talk about it. We could fill the calendar. But uh, that's, that doesn't draw us to Christ. What draws us to Christ is this word and the spirit of God teaching us of him. And you know, the Lord uses those things to wean us from this world. You know, we can look back and thank him even for the most difficult thing, the most tender relationship that he's ripped us from, if, if, if he's taught us of Christ, we can rest in that and, and think, if this has brought me closer to Christ, I thank him for it. I thank him for it. But now, and John needs this encouragement. You think about where John is. I mean, he's the one writing these things. Where is he? On the Isle of Patmos, in exile. He has no fellowship. He is alone. They purposed it that way. They purposed to isolate him. 
to breaking. And this isn't just some prisoner war camp. This is over the gospel. And yet, what does the Spirit do? Continue to teach him and reveal those things that were made a comfort to him at that time and are a comfort to us today, you see. But what does he see here in, in chapter 15? You notice his, his mind is constantly brought to heaven. That's where we need our minds brought, off the earth to heaven. And he sees the sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, the sea of glass, I've never been on one of these cruises. I've flown plenty of times over water. But when that water is calm, when the water is calm, isn't it like a glass mirror? Have you ever seen a perfectly calm lake that if you can get up and just look down upon it, the reflection, some photographers have been able to capture it sometimes in a picture where you can just see the beauty of the, the surrounding there all on this sea of, of glass. What is, what is John seeing here? He's seeing rest. He is seeing calm. And notice in verse 2, it says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now there, the church is enjoying the rest because it's just those in glory. When do we rest? When we're out of this world. But that sea of glass is mixed with fire because those that are described here have, been, have come through great tribulation. You see, that's what the fire describes there. That, there's that rest, but it wasn't without tribulation. And that's, that's the way it is, dear friends. In this world, we're going to know tribulation. But we look to that rest <laughs> that, is, that, that is ours in Christ, in glory. And it says here, and them that had gotten the victory, in other words, they persevered by God's grace. They stood against the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. Remember 666? That number meaning the number of man. They didn't, they didn't fall in line with works religion. They stood their ground till death. You see, that's, that's who's described here. And, and what is their end? You know, from the world's perspective, Earth's perspective, here was a troubled people <laughs> cast about by the world and the world mocking. But where do we see him in glory? Standing. Standing. That's a sign of triumph, isn't it? On the sea of glass and having the harps of God. I like that because, dear friends, everything about glory, everything about heaven, Anybody that's there is going to be there because of God. Salvations of the Lord. Even down to the harps that they were playing. Where'd they get those harps? They're called the harps of God. The ability to sing to his glory. To play to his glory. To glorify his name. It's because of him. It's not any natural talent. It's because of him. And you see... This sea where the, where the church stands victorious. What song are they singing? This was an interesting uh, coincidence. <laughs> what we call coincidence, providence. Because haven't we just been studying this in our Bible study in Exodus 15? And then when we got back in our time of prayer with the men, Brother David not knowing even, unless he read ahead, not knowing that we were going to be uh, looking at this in the message. He had us read together this song of Moses. You know, where's it taken from? Come back here to Exodus chapter 15. Parts of, of it is quoted here in verses 3 and 4, where it says, uh, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. It's given a summary of this song of Moses. But I find it interesting here in Revelation. It's called the song of Moses, the servant of God. But then in verse 3 it says, and even the song of the Lamb. <laughs> it has always been the song of the Lamb. That's why we're singing it. And back here in Exodus chapter 15, they sang this song starting in verse 1. 
going all the way down to uh, verse 19. See, 19 verses in Exodus 15 summarized here in two, but it's still the same song. And you can take and write above chapter 15 right there of Exodus if you want to, the song of the Lamb. <laughs> that would be a good one to put. That, that's what it was about. It wasn't just about coming out of Egypt. It wasn't just about that particular incident where the Lord delivered them. This was about the Lamb. And I'm not going to read this entire psalm to you for time's sake, but I do want you to note some characteristics of it and why it is the Lord's redeemed will be singing it in glory. And only the redeemed. First of all, you notice in this, in this song, they sang it unto the Lord. All true singing ought to be unto the Lord. Songs that, you know, have in view people and are addressing people in the song aren't unto the Lord. You know, won't you do this? So-and-so uh, -and -so did this, so why don't you? You know, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. What's that about? That's about me. That's about me. Look at, look at verse 2 here. The Lord is my strength in song. That's a song to the Lamb. And He is become my salvation. He is become my salvation. How? He was made sin who knew no sin that we might be made the very righteousness of God in him. He became my salvation. He was purposed as my salvation from eternity, but he became my salvation when he came and died and rose again. He's my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. You know, any hymn that doesn't have the Lord in view and his glory and his accomplished work isn't worth singing. Particularly, don't call it a hymn. Because <laughs> a hymn is about him. That's what it's about. The second thing that I'd have you to note here in, in verse 11, again, some key thoughts that I can just leave with you here. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? There are many gods that are being worshipped today. And notice it's little g-o-d-s. If it is not the God who has satisfied himself by the death of his son, by whom justice has been satisfied by that blood, it is a little G-O-D that they're worshiping. You take anything and add it to the work of Christ, I don't care how fervent a person is in that worship, he's an idolater. Who is like unto thee, O oh Lord, among the gods. There are going to be these gods. There's going to be worship places all around us until this world passes. God's purpose is to be so. But he's caused, he's purposed to have his people stand out and be separate. And you say, well, what distinguishes the true God from the others? Right here, who is like thee, glorious in holiness. See, that's the thing that this religious world's not dealing with. Everybody's running around talking about God's love. But I'll tell you, that love is subservient to his holiness. The only way God can love is that his justice be satisfied. We have to deal with his holiness. You do. That's the characteristic of this God that we're studying right here. If these people stand on the sea of glass and, the, and, and worship the king of saints, then it must be that God has found a way that he can be just and justify them and he did through his son the Lord Jesus Christ that's who the king of saints is he led the way in that justice he led the way in that righteousness he established it God imputed it and accepted it on behalf of sinners such as we are and therefore it says here fearful and praises fearful means you know worthy of worship any other sort of God is not worthy of worship doing wonders a third thing over here in verse 13. You notice here how it puts mercy and justice together. Thou in mercy hast led forth the people, but how? Which thou hast redeemed. There's no mercy without redemption. That Passover lamb had to be shed. That blood had to be shed in order for God to show mercy. Christ had to die 
in order for him to be merciful to you or to me. And then down here in verse 4, or 16, I'm sorry, fourth point, fear and fall upon them, that is the world, by the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. Right now, everybody walking around cocksure of heaven. It's hard to find somebody. You can't find anybody. I've never, never attended a funeral where they've preached a lost man's funeral. I don't care how, how horrible the person was. He's had some experience that they're going to point to and say, well, God will accept him. But there's a day coming when every mouth shall be stopped. And it says uh, here that no enemy of the Lord's people is going to be able to stand in the way of God saving them, delivering them. It says here, by the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over. But again, who? <laughs> Which thou hast purchased. We sing that song, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. That's a blessed truth. And that's, that's the song here. So you see this victory over the Egyptians was but a foreshadowing of the victory of all of God's redeemed over the beast, over his image, over his number, and therefore the church triumphant sings. Now, come down here to verses 5 through 8 of uh, Revelation 15. What's this temple all about? Because it says here in verse 5, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Let me ask you a question to make this simple. What was the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in the Old Testament a symbol of? Of Christ. What is it here? Why would it be any different? You can take your pen, and next to the word temple, you can write Christ. What John saw here in glory was a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's the temple. That's the place of worship. That's where God has caused his glory to, to, to dwell. <laughs> He's the mercy seat, isn't he? He continues so in glory. Isn't he that, that uh, one upon whom the blood was shed or sprinkled, that altar? That's him. So everywhere we see the temple, put Christ, because that's who it's about. This is what the writer of the Hebrews said. Look over in Hebrews chapter 9. These things are symbolic, but, dear friends, it has to do with Christ. You know, who's writing this? Isn't it the Apostle John? And it's interesting. You, you look to Hebrews 9. I'm going to be right back there in a minute. But when Christ was on earth, right at the beginning of his ministry, if you want to write this down, I want you in Hebrews 9, but in John chapter 2 and verse 19, it talks about the, the disciples uh, marveling about the temple and what was built there. And Christ, uh, when the Jews asked him, you know, what, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? He went in and chased out the, the money changers. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He was using symbolic language. It says the Jews, all they could think of was naturally. Forty and six years was this temple in building. They're talking about Herod having added on to it. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? Listen to what was revealed to John. But he spake of the temple of his body. All right? That's what that temple was all about. That's why it's destroyed today. It's not going to be rebuilt in God's plan and purpose. Don't, don't send your funds. There's a, a march in Washington right now going on by a, a preacher by the name of John Hagee. That, uh, he's a televangelist, so-called, and he's, he's got 30,000 people that he's offering his book free to when they show up that has to do with how we need to support and defend the rebellious Jewish nation that's in place over there right now, the God-haters. You say, you're calling them God-haters? That's exactly right. They have the same attitude toward Christ today as they had in his day. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
Don't give your money. Don't go to Washington. Don't support that. That doesn't have a thing to do with God's glory. God's glory is in Christ. God's glory is in Christ. And we see that here in uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 23, talking about that old tabernacle or temple. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So that's what John was seeing here. Here's his hope. Here he is on earth being persecuted because of this message. The Spirit of God directs his attention to heaven and he sees the temple. He sees Christ, who is God's altar, who is God's glory. And uh, when it says there in verse 6, the seven angels came out of the temple. Everything that God does, he does through his son, doesn't he? The messenger sent, whether for the elect, as it says, he sends his, his angels to give them charge over his elect, or whether for judgment, it comes from the hand of Christ. All power is given unto, unto him. And that's what we see here. The temple filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. You know, when you read that, did it draw your attention to one other passage of scripture? Isaiah? In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Who was that about? Read John 12. It says it was about Christ. It was about Christ. It's always about him. And uh, we know that just as Christ is the sovereign mediator of his people for their salvation, he is also the sovereign judge to bring judgments. It's the same throne. To the one, it's a throne of grace. And to the rest, it's a throne of judgment. And as we begin to look at these seven last plagues, the vials that are poured out, it's a reminder that... Uh, this world can run, but it can't hide. And they may block their ears and not want to hear this message of Christ, but uh, they'll have to deal with it. They'll have to deal with it. But I pray that the Lord will bless this to our hearts as we've heard it and uh, as we go into the last chapters of Revelation. See again the glory of Christ, just as we've seen it to this point. All right.